Hello and welcome once again to another retro wrestling review for Cheap Shot Entertainment. This will be the third year. No, I started in the 2000s. I started this in 2020 as well. Um, so we've done 2020 pay-per-views. We've done 2021 pay-per-views. We've done 2022 pay-per-views. And now we're in 2023. So this will be the fourth year running of doing retro reviews for Cheap Shot Entertainment. You are the Cheap Shot Nation and I am your host, Luke. And we go squarely towards the January staple of the Royal Rumble, one of my favourite events of the year and something that I do endeavour to get my friends together and watch between us because there's nothing quite like watching a Royal Rumble with people around you um, because of the reaction and, and the just the pure joy when someone comes back that you're not expecting or whatever um, and obviously the main thing is the Royal Rumble and you usually get a, a title match in there somewhere so uh, the main thing I mean all the pay-per-views now are joint even though this the brands are split but back in 2002-2003 they were toying with having separate pay-per-views, doing one each, and then bringing all the people together for the big pay-per-views. And this would obviously be a big pay-per-view, um, with SmackDown having Armageddon the month before, in December 2002. Again, decent pay-per-view, a couple of really good matches there. Um, but we move on to the Royal Rumble, 19th of January 2003, in the Boston... TD Gardens in Boston, Massachusetts, Massachusetts uh, or otherwise known as the Fleet Centre as it is now. The theme song is Falling Apart by Trust Company and uh, the main event is obviously the Bertie Mann Royal Rumble match with the arena appearing in games such as Smackdown Here Comes the Pain WWE Raw 2 and WrestleMania 19. And it is available on the WWE Network hashtag 999, as well as being a sellout audience of 15,338 WWE fans. Uh, so we have a Sunday night heat, which is like the pre-show, the, the build-up show, what do they call it now, the kick-off show. Uh, it was Spike Dudley versus Stephen Richards, of which Spike Dudley came out on top. So we've got a lot to get through on this review, so we're going to jump into the main part of the video, because there's a couple of matches before the Royal Rumble, and yeah. It's going to be a good one, so I hope you enjoy the review, the podcast, the video, whatever you're watching on. Uh, do join us for future videos, because I really enjoy doing these uh, retro reviews, and I hope you enjoy listening to them. I will see you in the main part of the video. So we start off with a qualifying match for the Royal Rumble. This feud has been going for a couple of months now, ever since Survivor Series 2002, where Big Show took the championship from Brock Lesnar with the help of Paul Heyman, who is now managing the Big Show. Uh, Big Show comes marching down to the ring first with Paul Heyman, Brock Lesnar, is on his way next. He looks like an absolute beast at this point. Obviously still a young young man. Uh, with his whole career in front of him. It's sad that it did end for a while uh, in WWE the following year. But, you know, he would come back and, and obviously dominate again. Which is really cool. Um, and 
yeah, the winner in this match gets a spot in the coveted Royal Rumble. Of which, this match is very quick, but it obviously needs to be because one of these guys is going to be in the Royal Rumble and is going to be wrestling essentially twice uh, and potentially going from number one to number 30 depending on what number is drawn. So yeah, they've got to they've got to qualify. Uh, Paul Heyman does his very best to help the Big Show here, but you know that the Big Show is purely a transitional champion at this point in time. He's wearing he's wearing his singlet, but he's also wearing black jeans. There's not much to him at this point. It doesn't it doesn't look the part, in my opinion. Uh, as a wrestler obviously they're changing it up a little bit for him uh, and he's you know he, he's he's got he's gotten really big at this point in time so uh, he, you know he's struggling uh, again at this point in time as well with his weight and stuff so uh, Vince being big on the big show literally did you know offer to help Big Show to uh, you know get back to fitness. I mean, his in his prime, Big Show was absolutely phenomenal. He was a phenomenal athlete, and it doesn't show here. Really, doesn't. He puts on a good match as you'd expect from a veteran such as Big Show, and ultimately comes up short against Brock Lesnar, the younger, faster, fitter, stronger. Brock Lesnar, uh, who would jump out of a choke slam, F five the Big Show and get the pin, and it's as simple as that. He gets the pin. Brock Lesnar goes to the main event, which is the Royal Rumble, and obviously. Paul Heyman's very annoyed by this, and so is the big show but I'm going to give this match it's difficult to I did enjoy it so I'm going to give it a three cheap shots out of five even though it was a very short match like I say it, was a, it should be because they're going into the main event as well and uh, yeah it, it did its job it did its job for me it continued the story a story that did need finishing here because it wasn't really going anywhere. We move on to Terry interviewing Chris Jericho, who says that he had the opportunity to pick any number of entrant to enter the Royal Rumble. And he corrects her quite rightly because he is the Ayatollah and says, actually... I did not get to choose whichever number because there's favoritism in the WWE and Vince McMahon handed Shawn Michaels entrant number one, which is why he picked entrant number two. And superstar after superstar is going to be eliminated by Y2J in his road to regaining his championship at... WrestleMania. And then we go on to the next match, which is for the World Tag Team Championships. It is the Un-Americans of Lance Storm and the uncomparable, uncomparable, absolutely legendary William Regal, who can do no wrong in my book and uh, nothing will ever be proven when people say that he's a cheat because we go on to that match and they are going against the Dudley boys of course the Un-Americans are the tag team champions the WWE like to line up the foreigners as being the heels as being the bad guys so that the Americans the stinky smelly American people can chant USA USA, USA, over and over again, like it's going to give the Dudley boys 
power. Sorry I went into full reverend mode there. Cut a promo on the Dudley Boys. Probably not a good idea. But the match itself, again, very quick, as you'd expect from a Royal Rumble pay-per-view of three hours long where the Royal Rumble match itself is going to be around 60 minutes plus. So, uh, yeah, so it is, again, it's a bit of a throwaway match. Uh, it had some decent moments in it. Uh, Chief Morley, Chief of Staff Morley, would come down to the ring to distract the referee for some reason. And um, with the referee distracted, William Regal would try and hit the power of the punch. He missed. He got flapjacked into the 3D. And then Devon would pick up the Nux and hit Lance Storm with them to win the championships. The World Tag Team Champions are now the Dudley Boys. And they are champions again, multiple times over. Like I say, a bit of a throwaway match. Uh, there's not much time to capture the imagination here, but it was a serviceable match with how much time they had to work with. Now, a lot of people who review wrestling have not come from the background of actually being in wrestling. They've only looked at it upon the as a, a through the eyes of a fan. Now, I know from experience that quite often a three-hour show, depending on how many matches, you've probably got 10 to 15 minutes to put on a match. And especially if there's a big match at the end of the night, it's probably going to be around the 10-minute mark. And that's difficult. That is difficult to do. In some companies, they work entrance to exit. So whilst you've got 10 minutes, whilst 15 minutes, 20 minutes sounds like a very long time, if you have five minutes off for the entrances and then you have five minutes at the end for celebrations and, and leaving, you've got a 10 minute match and you've got to put a lot of stuff in that match. And these, these two teams, they're veterans, they know what they're doing, they got the job done and um, and and you've got new world tag team champions. I think it was the right decision. They did need tag team championship changes here because the un-Americans were coming becoming stale. They the standard like I say standard foreign heels here uh, with the un-Americans and the Dudley Boys had just reformed uh, at Survivor Series. So yeah, it made absolute sense that they would pick up the win. Again, I'm going to go down the middle here. I'm going to give this two and a half cheap shots out of five. Not quite as good as the opening match because of Brock Lesnar being just an absolute beast and uh, and Big Show being awesome as well. I love these two teams, but again, two and a half cheap shots out of five. So before we go into the next match, we get a uh, promo package for the... Colossus of Boggo Road, Nathan Jones. Good day, mate. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was really bad. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the Colossus of Boggo Road didn't quite go so well for WWE. The promo was really cool. You know, it was Nathan Jones in a prison and, and being locked up. And then all these promos. Uh, they had to move him from Tasmania to... Brisbane, because of security reasons, and the lock, and, and there's no, well, there's a turny lock and, and no padlock on it, so he wouldn't have just been able to walk out anyway. But, uh, yeah, there's a review on security in Australia for prisons, but apparently it's okay for WWE to bring him out of prison and put him in a wrestling situation. Maybe it would have been safer in staying in prison because... He was a bit of a flop. Um, and say so he came out, he came in with this sort of uh, grr sort of thing. 
uh, by WrestleMania, he didn't even get a match. He was supposed to be tagging with The Undertaker, which we'll obviously get to when we get to it. He's supposed to be tagging with The Undertaker, but he was so bad that The Undertaker actually said, no, <laughs> no, on goal, two on one with The Big Show and A-Train. Yeah, <laughs> we got that to look forward to. Woohoo! Um, <clears throat> so the next match is a Divas match, and it is Dawn Marie versus Tori Wilson, and it's billed as the stepmother versus stepdaughter, the first ever and the last ever, thank goodness, match of this kind. Because Dawn Marie has caused Tori Wilson great heartache by killing her father, death by snoo snoo. And obviously that leads to a match. They they had a fight in a funeral parlour over Al Wilson's prone body. And uh, Dawn Marie smashed a lamp over Tory Wilson's head and we leaped into this match. So this rivalry has been going on for a couple of months, uh, including Armageddon, where it sort of culminated with the video that, showed Tori Wilson going to Dormarie's room and feeding the strawberries and all that kind of stuff. Very good, very good TV. Um, <laughs> uh, very 2002, and it doesn't stop there in 2002 because it transfers over to 2003 with the death of Al Wilson. Anyway, get this match. Uh, wasn't expecting much from this match, but you know what? The basics are there. There's some really nice arm drags from Tori Wilson and from Dawn Marie herself, the transition from a uh, from the uh, lockup into an armbar and a Fujiwara was really good. And there's some really good technical wrestling here. There was a few moments where they didn't quite uh, communicate on the level, but. You know, for two women who were in a time where they were just brought in to show their bodies, this is actually a pretty good match. And if you if you look at it from a that sort of standpoint where it's not just two women slapping each other, they are actually quite physical in this match, then you can appreciate it. Like I say, they are in their infancy, infancy when it comes to actual in-ring competing. So you have to appreciate that for what it is. Simply because, you know, normally you'd be in training for a couple of years and then get your first match on the main roster. These ladies are obviously in as a result of the invasion, the, the merger and all that kind of stuff, which is great. But then they've not had time to trained properly which is an absolute testament to fit finley um who made sure these ladies were absolutely ready to put on a five minute match and that's exactly what they did and i feel the crowd could have given them a bit more love than what they did uh, i did hear a slight chant of we want puppies uh 2003 everybody but let's appreciate this match, because if you go back, it is a decent technical match. It's not a masterpiece by any means, but it's very enjoyable. And I'm going to give it two cheap shots out of five, and I stand by that, because it is an enjoyable wrestling match, not just a bikini-clad uh, fight with two ladies who don't know what they're doing, because... They thought about this, they planned this, it looked like they did, and they got to the end. And it ended with a very simple move, which was a swinging neck breaker. And to me, that was quite old school, because if you do anything like that, like a DDT or a neck breaker or anything that involves dropping someone on the head, then that, to me, should be the end of the match. Not jumping up and doing six super kicks and a, and a flip. You know, so yeah, kudos for that. Two cheap shots out of five. Well done, Tory Wilson. Well done, Dawn Marie. God bless you, Al Wilson, who lived the life and 
died by Snoo Snoo. It is the thing that we all want. On to the next match. So we move on to the next match, which is for the World Heavyweight Championship. It is the champion, Triple H, winning the title back from Shawn Michaels at Armageddon in the three stages of Hell match. Hellacious match. He is now going to the Royal Rumble as the champion to go against the returning to WWE, Scott Steiner, the most sought after free agent. Um, of 2002 and uh, yeah it's um, obviously Triple H coming down to the ring with Ric Flair as well so we've got an extra element in there and it's it's a longer match obviously you'd expect that for what it is because it's for the World Heavyweight Championship but there is a decided ring rust to Scott Steiner's work here um, with Triple H basically carrying the whole lot and doing all the flips and taking all the bumps. With it being a championship match, Triple H trying everything he can to win, including cheating, uh, pulling out the sledgehammer. In the end, Ric Flair doing everything he can to get the stoppage as well and um, then you've got Scott Steiner just chucking Triple H everywhere quite rough quite stiff um, as he always was in WCW go and watch some of the last pay-per-views in WCW history in 2001 the beginning of 2001 and you'll see what I mean um, he hasn't really done anything since because he's just been sitting out his uh, on his guaranteed money. And, um, yeah, uh, it's a long time coming. It's, you, we're talking like two years for Scott Steiner to get to WWE again. Obviously came into huge fanfare at Survivor Series, but here he really does show... That apart from the look, he is quite stiff. And you can see Triple H carrying the whole match. And that's a damn shame. Because the people in the audience could see it as well. And they, they audibly start booing Scott Steiner. Obviously he's come in as a face to go against Triple H who's the ultimate heel. At this point in time, wearing the suits, the shirts, the ties, that kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, it's not an awful match. Um, but it's very down the middle. You'd expect a lot better for a championship match of this calibre. And it's quite disappointing with that. They do fight on the outside. They go down the ramp. Uh, Triple H tries to hit Skadana with the belt. As Ric Flair is distracting Earl Hebner, who a couple of times could have ended the match and didn't because of the disqualification rules, meaning that Triple H would keep the title. And that had a heightened drama to it, which gets it an extra half star. But uh, yeah, for a championship match, I would expect a lot more. Um, like I say, Triple H bumping like a like a madman, really, and uh, like I say, the belt shot, definitely not enough to bust Triple H open, but Triple H at this point in time, uh, he liked to bleed, and uh, there is a, a busted head, as uh, Ric Flair tries to get the referee to stop it, he does not, he does eventually, um, with the hammer shot to Steiner, and... Uh, yeah, he, he does not have that anymore. And there's a couple of times he chucks Earl Hebner out of the ring, pushes Earl Hebner over. But the hammer shot is the final straw. And like I say, people are audibly booing because of the finish. And again, it's a damn shame. 
Triple H is your winner. I'm going to give this one two cheap shots out of five. Um, Triple H coming off a damn near perfect match with Shawn Michaels tells you a lot about those two and the chemistry. This one was completely the opposite. It was, like I say, it wasn't bad. It just wasn't great. It wasn't the title match that you'd expect from a World Heavyweight Championship match, including Triple H. So, yeah, left myself quite disappointed with this one. But we move on to the next match, and uh, that is your WWE Championship match. We move on to the WWE Championship match. It is Kurt Angle coming down to the ring with his new team of Team Angle. Charlie Haas, Shelton Benjamin, Charlie Haas no longer with the company. Shelton Benjamin is with the company, but they're not using him properly or using him at all. Uh, and obviously Kurt Angle comes back every so, every so often for a celebration or something along those lines. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, looking back at 2003, this team was just phenomenal. It was like the precursor. It was the bloodline before the bloodline, even though there was obviously no relation between the, all three of them. It was just an awesome team. And then you had Paul Heyman with them as well. So it's like, yeah, it's definitely a, uh, similarities there. And Kurt Angle's going against Chris Benoit a long time a long time rival of Kurt Angle and sorry about that my dog's uh, barking we've got a knock at the door and uh, and yeah this is a an absolute wrestling classic you got to say uh we go from a match that was quite disappointing in the way it played out to a match that was nowhere near disappointing throughout the whole thing and it was absolutely fantastic really really good from start to finish told a story there's a rivalry that's lasted a long time here they've had matches before also very very good matches and uh, yeah, this match is just, it's phenomenal. It's, yeah, it shows exactly what we're missing with Chris Benoit no longer being with us and doing what he did. I don't condone what he did. And every time I review one of his matches on one of these retro reviews, I will say that he was not right in what he did at all. But as a wrestler, he was really, really good. Really good. And going against Kurt Angle, absolute equal. Coming from two different worlds, of course. Kurt Angle being the wrestling Olympic wrestling champion. And Chris Benoit coming from Stu Hart's dungeon. Very famed, in fact. And, uh, yeah, this is a real back and forth between the two technical masterpieces. is. Uh, one you know, strong strikes, submissions put in, reversed submission, extra put in, reversed. Um, but it would be a submission finish that would win the match for Kurt Angle and retain his championship. As Chris Benoit goes for the crippler crossface, he manages to get that locked in. Um, does so with Kurt Angle battling all the way, tries to roll through, goes all the way through, continues with the lock. Kurt Angle picks the ankle, only a Kurt Angle could do, and puts in the ankle lock. Chris Benoit fights, fights so hard. The crowd is absolutely electric for this match, and that heightened my enjoyment watching it on the network. Because Kurt Angle does eventually get the leg grapevine and makes Chris Benoit tap. Kurt Angle retains the championship and it's still your 
champion. And this was the purest wrestling moment possibly of all of the matches that I've watched because Chris Benoit got a standing ovation even though he had lost the match. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Can't say any more. This match is, for me, it's perfect. Five cheap shots out of five. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, so he gets, a, he gets the standing ovation. He um, very rightly deserved. And we move on to the Royal Rumble match now. So we're finally on to the Royal Rumble, which is the 30-man Royal Rumble match. They didn't have a women's match at this point in time. Uh, that would obviously come a lot later and they would intersperse some women into this match throughout the years but I'm glad that they've got their own match now. Uh, the announcers for this one are officially Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler in the stakes of changing the commentators all the way through and uh, yeah we get a mixed brand Royal Rumble 15 from Raw, 15 from SmackDown, and uh, yeah, it would just be again, it's a Royal Rumble, it's a free for all, isn't it? So, Shawn Michaels would start at number one, Chris Jericho would start at number two, and obviously, every, every 90 seconds from there, you would get a new entrant. And the way to eliminate your opponent, as if you didn't know if you're watching this, would be to throw your opponent over the top. And both feet must hit the floor, a la Shawn Michaels in 1995. I want to say 95. Pretty sure it was 95. Um, could have been 96, actually. Could have been 96. Anyway. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, Chris Jericho starts off with a sneak attack in this one. Quite well done. Uh, with um, Christian doing the Chris Jericho's entrance for him distracting Shawn Michaels, Chris Jericho goes in, smashes Shawn Michaels and starts beating him up. Shawn Michaels never gets out of the blocks here and uh, Shawn Michaels goes for the blade really early in this one and it's completely just unnecessary um, because Jericho dumps Michaels' beaten, battered body over the top rope and Michaels doesn't last very long. Uh, very disappointed with Michael's short tenure in this match, but it did tell the story of Jericho and Shawn Michaels. It continued that, and obviously we would get a really good match at WrestleMania 19. So for that reason alone, it's okay. Uh, notable marks in this match, of course, are uh, when Edge and Rey Mysterio are in the ring together. They're bouncing round. Uh, Tommy Dreamer makes an appearance in this Royal Rumble, brings kendo sticks with him and starts smashing people about. Uh, Chris Jericho actually gets a massive whelk on his forehead, so big that it actually bursts during the match because it's filled with blood. Um, yeah, I don't think they planned that, but that's, that's my lasting memory. Of this match. Um, and then you've obviously got. Chris Nowinski coming down to the ring. His first. Uh, appearance in a Royal Rumble. Since. The uh, Tough Enough. Series. Uh, Maven makes his second appearance. In this Royal Rumble. Almost eliminates the Undertaker again. Undertaker turns around. And just smashes Maven. In the face with his big suit boat. Suit bone hands. Uh, again, very. That was quite entertaining because of the year before, Maven eliminated the Undertaker and the Undertaker smashed Maven through a popcorn machine. Um, so, yeah, Christian teams up with Jericho as well in this one. So you got Ed Mysterio, Christian, Chris Jericho. Uh, the couple of things that, you know, they go towards the tag team style. Uh, Ray does incredibly well. Chris Jericho does a lot better. Um, 
You've got Bill Demott in there, also known as Hugh Morris in WCW, um, who would also be a head trainer for WWE and uh, get fired because of his actions. And uh, yeah, you then get B squared, Bull Buchanan. Uh, this is not his gimmick very long, very long because of him being associated with John Cena. And um, yeah, he just did not get over in this gimmick at all. Uh, then you've got Kane, you've got Rob Van Dam, uh, they are fighting. Uh, they, they join up, they, they fight, uh, and they fight, they fight, they fight. Matt Hardy's in there, comes down with Shannon Moore. Shannon Moore keeps Matt Hardy in the Royal Rumble a couple of times as well. And you've got um, Eddie Guerrero. Uh, Jeff Hardy comes down. He hits several moves on his brother because they're feuding now. Rosie from Three Minutes Warning. Rico... You've got um, Jamal as well. Test coming down with Stacey Keebler with all the testicles cheering cheering him on. John Cena as well um, comes out and does a rap mentioning that his style's like a swollen penis. Penis? His style's are like a swollen penis. You can't beat him. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah. I don't think the uh, they were expecting John Cena to to look at that, but Cena is actually wearing full on jeans, which looks very weird. Uh, Team Angle Charlie Haas he comes down, and uh, obviously Benjamin's in there. Rikishi gets a short stint in there, going against Rosie uh, for a short while. Two big guys butting heads. Uh, Jamal. Again, butting heads with Rikishi as well, uh, also known as Umaga, again, no longer with us. Uh, we're getting down to the, the last bits now. Booker T comes in, we've got Kane, um, A Train in at number five, and uh, yeah, we're getting towards the end. Maven, again, like I mentioned, he almost eliminates The Undertaker again, trying to um, recreate. The year before, Goldust comes in, hits the Shattered Dreams on Benjamin, and we get a a, a reuniting of Goldust and Booker T. Uh, Dawson got Batista making his his Royal Rumble debut in two thousand three as well. He does really well. He he ends up in the last in the final five, and we've also got Brock Lesnar who won. The match against Big Show on the first match of the night. And this is his first Royal Rumble since making his uh, main roster debut in March 2002. And he's now babyface, of course, because Big Show uh, screwed him out of the title. Uh, Kurt Angle won the title from Big Show. And now Kurt Angle is heel and Brock Lesnar is still face. Uh, Team Angle tries to throw Lesnar out, but Brock throws them out instead. He hits an F5 on Matt Hardy over the top rope onto Team Angle, which is awesome. And uh, Hardy takes a bump to the outside as he goes up. Uh, Team Angle on the floor. A-Train with a bicycle kick on Batista as well. Number 30 spot is The Undertaker. And he is babyface now, which is interesting they got taken out by big show prior to this uh, so this was his return match uh, go straight after john cena and eliminates john cena and just got now the big dudes who got the a train with who hits the e bomb on the undertaker gain hits choke slam on lesnar and we have five dudes left plus rvd and they're all huge guys a train batista kane undertaker uh, all of these guys and are the D final four. It's Undertaker, Kane, Batista, and Lesnar. And uh, yeah, it is the F5 on Kane which eliminates him, and the F5 on 
Batista as well. He goes out. Tombstone on Lesnar. Batista gets back up. Uh, so Undertaker can clothesline Batista out of the ring. Good showing for him in the first, in his Royal Rumble debut. Undertaker pulls Kane up and says, right, we're going to team up against this guy, against Lesnar. And Undertaker throws Kane out and Lesnar then sneaks up on the Undertaker as he's gloating dumps the Undertaker out of the ring and Lesnar is your winner of the 2003 Royal Rumble. Massive props for this Royal Rumble. The 2002 one was iffy, but this one I really enjoyed. The finish was really good, put the Undertaker over really well and put Brock Lesnar over. There wasn't much that he hadn't done at this point in his career. He'd only been he'd been in the company for less than a year in the main roster. So yeah, really good really good pay per view actually. It was the right balance of everything, including the Royal Rumble match, which was great and you had the qualifying match to start with as well. It was always difficult doing the SmackDown and Raw uh, joint pay per views and getting the right balance of matches but this one was that first venture really into that they were brand split but they weren't really doing separate pay-per-views until sort of Armageddon uh, of 2002 so yeah this one was really good and Undertaker applauds him on the outside saying right you got me you got me. And the match lasted just under an hour at 53 minutes and 41 seconds. Um, I really enjoyed this pay-per-view. I re really enjoyed this Royal Rumble. It wasn't the best. Um, and we knew that Lesnar was going to pick up the win. It did set up the feud between Lesnar, uh, sorry, between Jericho and Michaels really nicely. Uh, they carried on to WrestleMania 19, which was always good, and Cena and Batista making their debuts. You know, these two would explode like huge in the next couple of years. Within two years, both of these guys were world champions on their respective brands. Again, like I say, really liked it. Jericho lasted the longest and also got the most eliminations as well. He lasted 38 minutes and 54 seconds. Um, so, yeah. There you go. Uh, so that's that's that. Yeah, I really enjoyed this Royal Rumble. I'm going to give it uh, three cheap shots out of five. The first time I've actually given cheap shots to a Royal Rumble match because they're really difficult to actually give a rating, really, to... And uh, obviously the best match of the night would be Kurt Angle and Benoit. The World Championship match was really disappointing. I quite liked the Tory wilson Dawn Marie match. They made it work even though they didn't have the skills to and they had no right to make it as entertaining as it was. They did a fantastic job. So that is Royal Rumble 2003. That is your review of said pay-per-view if you've watched this pay-per-view recently let us know give us a con give us some contact and join us on all social media stuff and um yeah keep watching old school wrestling because it is absolutely brilliant and as we are now into the new year uh, i hope you've had a good one and everything's going well for you in january we've got plenty more to come Plenty more to come and we're getting back to watching independent wrestling as well. So we should have some more reviews of actual wrestling shows. Well, that's it for Cheap Shot Entertainment for this month. You are the Cheap Shot Nation. I am your host, Luke. Join us around the 28th, 29th of January for a review of future which is the first show of the year for future wrestling. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you again. Goodbye.
Aye.